flip flops and counters are the topics we will discuss in this lecture. So remember, in the last lecture, we introduced the idea of sequential logic. So if we make kind of a family tree of logic, we've got combinational logic, and that's what we studied in the first part of the course. That's logic in which you have some input variables and then a logic circuit that implements some logic function, and then you get one or more output variables. And so there's no time element, at least in theory, associated with this. In practice, there's time delays and gates and things. But the idea is you give me those inputs, I can look up in the truth table or implement the logic function, and I get an output, and that's it. Then in the last lecture, we started to discuss sequential logic. Now this is logic where the output depends on the current inputs and also on the past sequence of inputs in some manner. And generally that manner is in, the, in terms of something that's been latched or stored, bit values that have been stored in latches or in some of the devices we'll talk about today. Now within sequential logic, we can have synchronous and a synchronous logic. Synchronous logic will be logic that we can think of as being clocked. This, things are synchronized because they're all um, responding to a common clock signal, whereas asynchronous logic Logic transitions occur whenever the inputs to different systems change. And so if you have very many, a large number of components in your logic circuit, their transitions between 0 and 1 states um, are not synchronized. So here are the two things we're primarily interested in this course. First of all, the combinational logic we already studied. And then for sequential logic, we're going to be interested in synchronous sequential logic. So anything that has a, a clock would be synchronous. So computers have clocks, your cell phone, etc. Asynchronous sequential logic can be tricky because you can get into weird situations where there's feedback and things, when one value changes, that affects something else that then in turn changes its value back and you get it into situations where there are oscillations and bizarre kind of behavior. Synchronous sequential logic is safe in that sense, and we'll see why. And, and, and at the heart of that, the flip-flop, we'll see how this basically enforces the synchronicity of these uh, synchronous systems. So this brings us to the idea of a flip-flop, and there are different types of flip-flops. We're going to look at the D flip-flop. Now, this is built from what we studied last time, which is the D-latch. Remember the D-latch has two inputs, D and E. D is for data and E is for enable, and two outputs. Um, Q and Q prime, we, the little inversion bubble there tells us that the, that lower output is the inverse of Q. So the way the latch works, remember, if the enable signal is high, is equal to 1, then Q tracks D. Whatever D is, Q will have the same value. As soon as the enable signal goes low, whatever value is in Q currently gets latched in. And now changes in D do not change the value of Q. So consider the following circuit. We're going to have two D latches.
and this will be latch one and latch two. We have a data input to the first D input of the input to for latch one, and then the output of latch one goes into latch two. And the output of latch two will be our output Q, and then the inverse of that will be Q prime. Now, our enable signals are gonna be driven by a single input C, which is gonna represent a clock. And we're gonna invert that, put that in as the first enable signal, invert it again, and put that in as the second enable signal. And that is a D flip-flop. Now let's see how it works. So imagine this clock signal through time. And uh, it's the clock signal. It looks like this. It's logic zero for a time. And it switches to logic one and then back to logic zero and does this periodically. So this is logic zero and this is logic one. So over here for our enable inputs to our D latches, let's see the first one, well this is C, so this would be C prime, the inverse of that. And then this would be another inverse, so this would be, would be back to C here. So when C is low, C prime is high. That means that L1 is enabled. L2 is not enabled. So L2 is in the latch state. So whatever value of Q uh, was being output there, when this clock went down to zero, logic level, that'll stay fixed, stay latched there. But L1 is enabled, that means that the L1 Q output will float and, and, and change as this D floats around, goes from zero to one. So it'll track that. Okay. So then what happens when the clock goes high? So we call this the rising edge. of the clock signal. Well, that C will be one, so this will be zero, so L1 will be disabled, and C will be one, so L2 will be enabled, and L1 disabled or not enabled. So that means L1 goes into the last latch state, and now L2 tracks the output of L1. Okay, so we see that it, when we go into this, hit this rising edge, what happens? L1 was enabled and it was, its output was tracking this input D. And then right when we have the rising edge, it suddenly latches that value. So let's call this TR, the rising edge transition. So the D at TR latched to Q1, the output of L1. And at the same time, L2 becomes enabled, so its output tracks its input, its D input. Okay, but that means that that D input is just the output, the Q output of the first latch. So that means that Q2 will be equal to Q1 equals D at the time of the rising edge. Okay, now, then we go back uh, and stay at, at a clock is equal to one for some period. Then we go down and we have a dropping edge here and uh, falling edge. And we go back to this state. So L1 is enabled. So it, it can track the, its output will track the input, but L2 is not, so it remains latched. And that occurs until we go to the next rising edge of the clock cycle. 
So what that means is between rising edges, the output of L2 will not change. Whatever the value of this input at that rising edge was for that entire clock cycle, high, low, uh, halves of that clock cycle, this output will remain at whatever the D was at the time of the rising edge. And then for the next rising edge, then we'll, we'll latch in the new value at the, the next rising edge over here somewhere. Okay, so this is how we are going to enforce uh, synchronous nature of these circuits. Everything is going to latch in their values um, based on this clock and this rising edge. So everything else in the circuit that has the same clock signal will go through the same process. Everything is finalized, we can think of it this way, at the time of the rising edge. And then all the combinational logic in the circuit will then have time for the time delays through gates and things to will progress through those and then everything will stabilize at some value and then the next rising edge will latch in those new output values and then go through another cycle. The symbol circuit for this D flip-flop looks like this. We've got a data input and the clock, we put this little triangle there. We can put a C on that representing a clock input. And then we've got a Q output and the inverse of that. And that there is your D flip-flop. If we take a D flip-flop, here's the clock signal and here's the D input the Q output the Q prime output and we feed back the Q prime output to the D input we'll call this input to the clock signal T then what is the Q output? Let's think about this. Um, all right, so every time on the rising edge of the input clock signal, in this case, that's the T signal, this is going to latch whatever the D value is into the Q output. But the D value is Q inverse. So whatever the Q was previously will latch in the inverse of that. That means it will toggle. So this is called a T flip-flop for toggle. And so at every rising edge of the, of the clock, this output changes from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. And we'll give it its own symbol here. Single input T. and Q and Q prime outputs. Now we can do a lot of interesting things with a toggle flip-flop. One is we can make a ripple counter by chaining these flip-flops together. Let's see how that would work. Suppose we take a T flip flop, and here's our input T signal, and we're going to input a clock signal to that. Here's our Q and Q prime outputs. The Q output we're going to call C0. And we know what would happen on every rising edge. We would have the a toggled version of whatever the this output was before. So if it started at zero, the next rising edge would go to one. The next rising edge would go to back to zero, and so on. Now we take another T flip flop, and 
on the output of this one, we're going to call C1, and we drive that T flip flop with the Q prime output of the previous. And then we can do that again as many times as we want. Q and Q prime. And this output we could call C2. Drive it with the Q prime output of the previous flip flop. And so what's going to happen here? So um, let's first of all just look at what the T flip flop does if we input a clock signal. So I suppose this is our, our input. Uh, we'll make this T is equal to zero here. So we start off with zero values, then we go up to a one value, back to zero, back to one, and so on. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the T value right there. So what would be for the T flip-flop, what would be the Q value? So suppose we start off with Q is equal to zero, then on the rising edge, right? So this is, let's just make little marks here for the rising edges. That's when we're going to toggle. So we start off with Q is equal to zero, and then we toggle the one. Then it stays there until the next rising edge, and then we toggle back to zero. So you can see what's going to happen. This is the Q output value. Um, Q and Q prime, right, the two outputs, have two, time, two times the period of the T input. Right, because it takes, it takes two rising edges to go from zero to one and back to zero. And each rising edge is a complete cycle of the T input clock. So you're going to have a period that's twice as long. That means a frequency that's half the, the frequency of the, of the clock that goes in. So this C0, let's say this, this clock has a, a period T sub C then this is going to have a period 2TC, and then its output is, uh, goes in to the, become the T input for the next flip-flop. So that's going to have 4TC, and then twice that again, 8TC, etc. So each one of these T flip-flops that we cascade in this manner is going to create this oscillating patterns of zeros and ones, but with eight, uh, twice the period of the previous output. All right, so let's now sketch this out, this, the behavior of this circuit. So this is going to be the clock input here, period TC. Okay, so that is going to, let's say, starts off at uh, zero and goes to one, back to zero, and so on. And then we're going to have the output of the first T flip flop, C0. And so let's assume, uh, so let's, let's first of all note the rising edges here, the clock. Okay, so let's assume that starting right here, our output of the C0 
begins at zero. It, it is, uh, tra transitions to zero on this right rising edge right here. Okay. Well, on the next rising edge, it's going to transition to one. So it's going to go zero, one. Next rising edge, you go to zero, and then one, and so on. How about the next T flip flop output? This will be C1. Now notice we take the Q prime output of the previous T flip flop and use that for the uh, input, the toggle input. So the transitions are going to be on the positive uh, rising edge of Q prime. That's going to be on the falling edge of Q. And so let's put that down here. So on the falling edge, that's when we'll have transitions for the C1. So suppose C1 starts off at zero. On that fall first falling edge, it's going to transition to one. On the next falling edge, it's going to transition down to zero and so on. What's going to happen with the next bit? C2. All right, so its, uh, it's T input is the Q prime from the C1 T flip-flop. So it's going to be the inverse of this, right? So this is going to transition on the downward falling edge of C1. Again, because that the falling edge of C1 will be the rising edge of the inverse of that. Okay, so what will this signal do? So let's assume we start off at zero. We're going to go all the way to here, then it's going to go up to one, and so on. And so each of these transitions, the period will be twice what the input was. So if the clock has a particular period, the C0 will have twice that period, C1 have twice that, C2 twice that, and so on. And so if we label these values, like here's a, this is zero. Let's make these, these are all zeros. And then this transitions to a one, and these are still zeros. Then this transitions back to a zero, and now this is a one, and that's zero. This transitions to a, a one, and this is a one, and that's a zero. And then this transitions to a zero, and this is a zero, and this is a one. So you can see what the, these slices here are the values at, so if this is TC is the, period of that, this was 2TC, and every 2TC, one of these three bits, either C0, Z, C1, or C2, or multiple of them, uh, changes. So we get 0, 0, 0, or if we go from the, we think of C2 as the most significant, then we get 0, 0, 0 going this way, then 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, well that looks familiar, that, look, that looks like the uh, rows of a truth table, C2, C1, C0. Let's call this state zero, when these are all zeros. State one, zero, zero, one. State two, zero, one, zero. State three, zero, one, one. State four, one, zero, zero and etc. And if we kept kept going with that and just had these and just ended things with these three T flip flops, this would just keep going until it comes all the way back at one zero one 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 zero one 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 and then we would come back to zero zero zero. And so this thing would cycle through all of the rows of the truth table for a three input logic function. Or we could, th if we think of these as uh, the binary representation of these numbers zero through seven, it would just cycle count through the numbers zero to seven and then repeat. So this is, this is why we call this a counter. And it's a ripple counter because of this, you know, the output of one ripples into the next. Think of it this way. Okay, so we can make a counter.
right? And uh, we can make that counter have as many bits as we want just by adding more flip-flops. Now there is an issue that, of course, in real circuits, there's a time delay from the input to the output. Um, and so there'd be a time delay here and then a little more there and then a little more there. So actually each one of these transitions would be a slightly offset in time relative to the previous one. Now, if that offset was much, much less than say our, our clock period, it might be negligible, but it's something to keep in mind. And certainly if we had tried to make like a 64 bit counter, uh, those delays might add up. So for that reason, if you're trying to make a faster counter, you might do something a little more sophisticated, which would have some sort of look ahead circuitry uh, to keep the transitions in time with each other. But we won't go into that. This is enough for us just to see how we can build a counter. Um, if, for example, this, this frequency uh, of this counter is very large, in other words, the period is very, very small, relative to the circuit of interest, um, then this wouldn't be an issue. One application of a counter um, is in a uh, microcontroller, microcontroller unit, MCU, uh, to step through instructions. So you can think of this as a instruction counter. Um, so there might be here, we'll have an address of some particular commands or instructions. And this would be a binary address. So say we have four bit address here, zero, zero, zero. And there's some instruction like load R1, load register R1. Um, this would actually be just a, a, you know, an English representation of what really would be some binary structure in the uh, arithmetic logic unit, say. And then the next instruction, maybe, then we have the, our counter counts this up to 001, and then there's some other instruction, say load register two, and then 010, so this would be, you know, 012. So the, the third instruction maybe is add R1 and R2, and so on. So, you know, a computer program would be compiled down into these so-called assembly instructions and they would be placed at different addresses in the instruction memory and then the instruction counter would just start at the beginning and just go one after the other down through this set of instructions to execute the program. Another application of a counter. So let's say here we have now counter circuit. And it's got this clock input. And it's got these, these outputs. Um, say two, three, C0, C1, and C2. And so we know that these will go through a cycle. Zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, and one, 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 and then repeat. Etc. Now, if we were to put those into some uh, combinational logic system, which has an output Y, right? So we put these 
the C values in as the inputs, that they really represent the A, uh, let's see, the A, B, and C inputs of some three input logic function. Well, then we could just observe the Y. This would just run through all of the rows in the truth table, and then we could observe the Y value, and maybe, you know, it would be 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and so on. And we could then actually observe as a signal the logic function produced by that circuit. You know, so it goes like zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, and etc. And this would be your Y output. So this would be useful in a logic analyzer. So it could be combined with an oscilloscope right, to test digital circuits you would have a counter that would generate any desired number of A, B, C, D, et cetera inputs. And then this counter would just cause you to the out, these outputs to just go through all the rows of the truth table. You put that into your, your device under test, your logic circuit, and you look at the output on the oscilloscope along with the counting signals, right? So you would have another row down here that would have your Y output. And then you could just go along and look, you should, you know what the circuit should produce, and then you could verify that the circuit is indeed behaving correctly. In fact, you could automate that whole process. The computer could just sample the Y output values and then just compare them to, say, a simulation to, to know whether your circuit is, is operating properly. Another thing you can do with a counter is to build a timer. These are really important in microcontrollers. Uh, so let's say we have here, say a four output counter. There's C0, C1, C2, and C3. And then here's our clock. It has some period T sub C. That's our clock input there. And now over here, we're going to have a comparator. And we'll just put these signals right in there. Suppose these are the A inputs. This is a 4-bit comparator. We saw how to build one of those in our discussions on arithmetic. And then we have, say, four more inputs, two, three, or, and then this has an output that goes high when these are equal. And then we put in some values, say one, zero, uh, one, one, zero, one, something like this. This is B0, B1, B2, B3. So what will happen? So we, we have these fixed constant values in for the Bs, and then this guy starts off all the A's zero, and then the clock cycles through, and this thing counts, right? You get these signals like this that count through the rows of the truth table, or you can think of just counting through the binary representations of integers zero, one, two, and so on. And when A3 equals B3, A2 equals B2, A1 equals B1, and A0 equals B0, this equal signal goes high. Okay, and then that would be your timer. Your timer would be up. Now you'd want to probably have uh, to add some reset capabilities, for example, um, or alternately, if you wanted to just continue to, to, to count, it would be, uh, it would be very useful because you would then just, these numbers would continue to count until you got to one, 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 and then it would go back to all zeros. 
So what you would probably want to do is add a reset signal so that when you actually reach this point of equality, now you've counted down. In this case, like this is the most significant. This would be 4 plus 2 all right, is uh, 6 plus 1 is 7. So this would count 7 of the cycles. And then you could reset it and then count that again if you wanted to. So we've seen that if we were able to reset our flip-flop values, we could reset a counter. And that could be really useful for timers and things like that. And our D flip-flops are built using D latches. So if we could make a D latch with a reset, or let's call it a clear signal, uh, that would be very useful. So here will be our symbol for that. So I have a D input. I'll put the E input here. And a clear input there. And this would be our Q and Q prime outputs. So one way to do this is to take the D latch we've already designed that does not have a clear input. You got D and E and Q and Q prime and add some circuitry. So what we're gonna do down here is we're gonna add in an OR gate. And that input is going to be our enable. We're also going to have or it with a clear signal. And then up here, we're going to have an AND gate with input equal to our data and the inverse of clear. Right, that little uh, inversion bubble there will just represent a, a not gate. All right, so let's see how this would work. So if clear, uh, well, actually, let's do this. Let's label label these. This this top output of the of the AND gate is going to be D and not clear, and the output of the OR gate is going to be E or clear. And remember how the D latch works. If the enable signal is high, then the output Q tracks the input D. So if, say if clear is equal to zero, then what do we get at the top input? Well, Clear is zero, so not clear is one. So D and one is just D. And down here, E or clear, clear is zero, so E or zero is just E. So we see that if we set the clear signal to zero, then the inputs are just D and E, just like a regular old uh, D latch. But if clear is equal to one, then what do we get down here? E or clear is now one or clear is, is equal to one. And D and not clear, not clear would be zero. So this would be zero. D and zero is zero. So E is equal to one. So that means that the Q is going to track the input D, but the input D is zero. Okay. So if we make the clear signal go high, then the Q output becomes zero. And of course, Q prime would be one. And then when we let clear go low, then that gets latched in. So that is a ability to clear or reset the D latch. So now if we just simply make our D flip-flop using these clearable D latches, we have something that looks like uh, this. It's clear D 
enable Q and Q prime. We have two of those. The output of the, the Q output of the first uh, latch goes into the D input of the second. The overall data input D goes into the D input of, of latch one, this is latch two. And then we've got our clock signal here. We invert that. Invert it again. Okay, so, so far, if we didn't make any use of the, the clear signals, that would just be a regular D flip-flop. But now we add in this clear signal. And there would be your D flip-flop with clear. So um, <clears throat> if clear is equal to zero, right, the D latches, as we said, behave just like a regular D latch without a clear. And so this would just be like a regular D flip-flop. But if we assert the clear signal, if it goes to one, that's gonna clear the outputs then of both of the latches. And then when the clear goes down back to zero, then this output Q here will latch in a zero and be reset or cleared. Okay, so our symbol for this flip-flop will be like so. D input, a clock input, clear, Q and Q prime. This would be your D flip flop. With clear or reset, if you want to think of it, think of it that way. So then we can make a T flip flop with clear. What we need to do is wire up our D flip-flop with clear so that the inverted output gets fed back in to the data. And here's our Q output, our clock input, and we've got this clear input. We can reset this whenever we want so that our counter would go back to zero. And then if we had a ripple counter, Um, so, the, well, let's actually give this a symbol first here. So this would be, say, Q, and Q prime, and clear, and this would be our toggle input T. Okay, so this would be a T flip-flop with clear. Then if we built a counter with this, it would look something like this. So here we have our clock. And this output here is our C0. Then we feed, um, I'm sorry, we feed the uh, inverse of that in the T input of the next T flip-flop. Like 
ça. And this output would be our C1. That would be our C2 and etc. And then all these clears can just be connected together. And this is continues on as for as many bits as we want in our counter. And then when we uh, get to our desired counted value, if we want to, like in our our circuit where we were making a timer, when we get up to this point where the equality is true, where we've reached this count, the count stored in the B values is reached by the A inputs, then we could take this equality output and feed that back in as a clear. Right, so this guy would say have a clear and then we could reset our our counter and then we could go through the timing sequence again now let's look at some of these circuits in logic circuit so here we have our d latch and this is the circuit for it that we described in the previous lecture and let's go and look at a test of that. Okay, so here is our D latch circuit. D and E inputs. E is enabled. D is the data. Q is the latch value of the output. And then Q prime, if we wanted to, we could put another LED down here, right, just to emphasize that it's the inverse of Q. So let's see how that circuit works. Um, now, when it, we first start these circuits up, they initialize uh, randomly. So notice when we we'll start this up again, some of these may be on and some of these may be off. Uh, and it'll, it'll be more or less a random, random thing there. Okay. Usually in a digital system, you would have some mechanism to enforce some initialization on power up. And you can get that with clear signals. And we'll look at that in a minute. So here's our D latch. Okay, so we have, if we enable this, then the D value, which is zero, goes directly to the Q output, and then you have the inverse of that here. And then if we disable that enable signal, now it doesn't matter what happens to the D input. It stays latched. If we now enable it again, and we set the data input to one, well now we get Q is one, Q prime is zero. Disable it, E is equal to zero, now that's value is latched. Okay, so that's our D latch. Then, well, let's see. Let's go back to our test. Uh, let's see. No, let's go here to our D flip flop. So the next we built uh, in this lecture, we built a D flip flop using two D latches and then this clock signal to drive the enable. And this was then inverted and inverted again. Okay, so this was our D flip-flop. So let's look at that a test. That's going to be this guy down here, DFF, D flip-flop. Let's see how this behaves. Okay. Um, so say we have zero is our DN. When the clock goes from zero to one on the rising edge, that value will be latched into the output. Now notice this is not the same as up here where we said, well, if this was equal to one and then we enable it, now that value goes to the output. But then if I change this, all right, then it, it, it changes at the output. Notice here, I can change this and nothing happens at the output. It's only on the rising edge, the transition from clock value zero to clock value one, that you get this latching. And that's the key to the synchronization. That forces everything to be synchronized to the rising edge of that clock. Okay, so now the clock goes down. Again, it doesn't matter, but now on the rising edge, it latches in that value, and that's there until the next rising edge. So that's the D flip-flop, built from two D latches and a little bit of other logic. Then we said it would be really nice to be able to clear values in either a latch or a flip-flop. So we looked at a D latch with clear. We took a normal D latch and we added this logic 
onto it to introduce a clear signal. So let's look at that. Here's the D latch with clear up here. Okay, so if we have it, right, whatever value uh, is latched at the output, it doesn't matter if we change the input until we enable this. Now the input value goes right to the output. If I disable, now that's latched. However, if I hit clear, it goes away. And now it doesn't matter what I, what I do with either the enable or the data input. This stays zero until I get rid of the clear. And now it goes back to working as a proper latch. Okay, so the clear overrides the other two input signals. And we said, well, we can make a D flip-flop with a clear signal just by having replacing the two D latches by D latches with clear inputs. And then we can just drive those two clear inputs here from the clear input now to the D flip-flop with clear. So let's go to the test. Here's our D flip-flop with clear. So on that, um, right, whatever value is here gets latched into the output on the rising edge. If I hit clear, it goes to zero. And it doesn't matter what happens over here. Until clear goes to zero. Now you can go back to latching this value on the rising edge. Now, if we take a D flip flop and we feed back the Q prime output at the inverse of the Q output back into the data input, we get a T flip flop. And if we do that with a D flip flop with clear, well, then we would have a T flip flop with clear. Okay, so we can make a ripple counter with that. Here we go. Here's a clock signal. And then it goes into a T flip flop with clear. And so notice all these clear signals are just tied together to a clear input. And the Q prime output of the first flip flop goes into the T input of the second and so on. And we can do that as many times as we want. So the first flip flop will give you the least significant bit in your count. So this will, this will be the ones place and the twos and the fours and the eights place. Okay, so let's run this. So down here in logic circuit, you can, you can choose the frequency. So this is set to one Hertz, one, one transition per second. There you go. See it counting through. I can, I can speed this up and it'll go much faster. Okay, so two, three, four, five. Now, anytime I hit clear, this everything goes to zero. And I, when I then set clear back down to zero, then it starts counting again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and back to zero. And again, at any time. In that process, I can hit clear and then start everything again. In a previous lecture, we saw the usefulness of an SR latch. And so recall that uh, this is a device with two inputs S and R and an output Q and QN. And S is the set signal. So S equals one, R equals zero, gives you that Q is equal to one, and then QN is equal to zero and the R is a reset signal. If R is equal to one and S is equal to zero, then Q is equal to zero and QN is equal to one. And finally, S equals R equals zero is the latch state. 
which holds the previously uh, determined values of Q and QN. So there's times when we would like a synchronous version of this. Right, this is an asynchronous piece of logic because whenever the S and the R signals change, the outputs will ch can change. We would like something where the outputs only change on the rising edge of a clock. So a synchronous version of this takes the form of what's called a JK flip-flop and it's built around a D flip-flop with some extra logic so let's uh, sketch that out here here we've got the D input and the, the clock input Q and Q prime And now the D, D input is going to come from an OR gate. And its inputs are going to come from two AND gates. And here is going to be the K input, and here the J input. Notice the K input is inverted, so this little inversion bubble is just a shorthand for a NOT gate. And then we feed back the Q signal and AND it with the inverted K. There, sorry. There we go. And we feed back the Q prime signal and and that with the J. Finally we have our clock signal also. So let's see, how does this work? Uh, so the the top AND gate is gonna give us Q and K prime, or we'll write as K prime and Q. The bottom AND gate, let's see, that's the AND between J and Q prime. So this is going to be J and Q prime. And then, of course, the D input here is going to be J and Q prime or K prime and Q. And because we're using a D flip-flop, positive edge, uh, with a positive edge triggering, this the output Q and Q prime values are only going to change on a positive edge. All right, so let's analyze this logic function that it gives you the input to the D, uh, the D input of the D flip-flop. So let's look at uh, first of all, let's let's realize that that if the clock is 0 or the clock is 1, we have no changes. Right? Because this the output Q values can only change on a positive uh, rising edge transition for the clock. Okay, so we'll, we'll represent that in a, like a truth table here. We'll have J, K, and the clock. And then we'll have the Q star, that means the next value of Q, and Q prime star, the next values. So we don't care what J or K is. If the clock is 0 or the clock is 1, we don't have any change to the Q and Q prime values. They stay the same. Now let's see what happens on a rising edge transition of the clock, which we'll represent by a little up arrow. 
Suppose both j and k are 0. j equals k equals 0. Then d is equal to j and not q, so 0 and not q, or k prime, which is 0 prime is 1, 1 and q. And that's just equal to what? 0 and anything is, is 0. And 1 and q is just q. So the next value of q will just be q. And then likewise, the next value of q prime will just be q prime. So this is like the latch state. And so on the rising edge, you just keep everything latched, right? You don't change any values. All right. Now let's see what happens if, say, j is equal to 0. But k is equal to 1. Well, then d is going to be 0 and not q, or so k is 1, so not k would be 0, 0 and q, and of course 0 and anything is 0, 0 or 0 is 0. So the value will be 0. So if j is 0 and k is 1 on the rising edge, q is going to uh, be latched to 0, and of course q prime will be 1. What about if uh, j is 1 and k is 0 on a rising edge? OK, so let's look at that. j is 1 and k is 0. What will d be? OK, well, 1 and not q. Or k prime. Well, k is 0, so k prime is 1, so 1 and q. So 1 and not q, or 1 and q. And of course, that's equal to q or not q, which is an identity that that's always equal to 1. All right, so in this case, q will be 1. And of course, not q then would be, would be 0. OK, so this then would be the reset state. And this would be like the set state set q to equal to 1, reset q to be equal to 0. Uh, and in the, in the SR latch, uh, s equals 1, r equals 1 was kind of an avoid state we didn't want to make use of. So let's see what happens if j is equal to k is equal to 1. Then what is d? OK, so it's 1 and q prime. Or, and k is equal to 1, so not k is 0, and q. Of course, 0 and q is 0. 1 and q prime is just equal to q prime. So in this state, if they're both 1 on the positive going transition, q flips to q prime, and then q prime, of course, is the, is the previous q value. So again, this, is, this would just be like a toggling. Uh, what's really useful, though, are these two states right here, where we can set or reset this value, just like for a, a, an SR latch, but it is now synchronized with this clock. So in this lecture, we've seen that uh, we can make digital systems which are synchronized by a clock. And in particular, like if we have the, the D flip-flop, so D input, or clock, or Q output, and our Q prime output. Then D is sent to the Q output on a rising edge. We'll use the arrow up to represent that, right? So this is where the clock signal would transition from logic low to logic high. Okay, so this is the rising edge right there.
That's when you, we synchronize everything to that rising edge. Sometimes it is useful to have, or, and, and we could call this rising edge triggered logic. Sometimes we would like to have things trigger on falling edge, uh, falling edge of the clock cycle. So if we wanted to have falling edge triggered logic, what could we do? Well, we could just invert the clock signal. And then our, let's say we do this here, here's our clock. And now we just put an inversion bubble there, which is a shorthand for an, a not gate. And then here are our Q and Q prime outputs. And so we, we invert the clock signal. All right, so that would mean then here would be your clock signal. And so let's say we go, we're low, then we go up, and then we're high, and then we go low. And right, we've got these rising and falling transitions. Well, what is the signal that goes into the D flip-flop? What does it look like? Well, it's just the inverse of that, the inverted version of that. So it's high, and then low, and then goes high. Okay, so in the D flip-flop, the latching is going to occur on this rising edge. But this is going to actually be C prime, not C, the inversion of C. So the rising edge of the inversion of C, but that's the falling edge of the actual C itself. So we've just converted a rising edge triggered flip D flip-flop to one that's a falling edge triggered D flip-flop. Now, if you go back and look at our circuit for the D flip-flop, right, and these were, these were D latches. Q and Q prime outputs. Here's our D coming in. And this was our clock input here. Okay, so that is the, that's your D flip flop. And that one has is a rising edge triggered. And we said all we need to do to make it falling edge triggered is to invert the clock signal. Okay, so we could put a knot gate here at the, at the beginning. But then we just have two knots in a row. Not, the knot of the knot is just the original function. So just get rid of this first knot gate. And there we would go. We would now have a D flip-flop that was Falling edge triggered. With that simple uh, variation.